Could the antipsychotic medication you're taking to help you with your mental health be doing lasting damage to your brain? In today's video, we are going to be talking about the long-term and potentially irreversible side effects of these drugs that almost no one talks about. We're going to be covering things like brain shrinkage, irreversible movement disorders, and cognitive decline. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Yosef. I'm a physician. I used to work at the FDA, and I was a drug safety expert for the pharmaceutical company. And I make these videos because honestly, these risks are rarely talked about, and doctors ought to be telling their patients about them so they can make informed decisions about their health. And really, from the statistics I've looked at recently, up to 58% of patients on these medications are never even taught about these serious risks such as tardive dyskinesia. So let's jump in and explore these sensitive topics. And if you stick around to the end, I'm gonna talk about what you can do if you've developed one of these problems and how you can recover from it. So first, what are the antipsychotics? Well, these are drugs that were originally used to treat schizophrenia. Common antipsychotics include things like Haldol, Risperidol, Seroquel, Latuda, Olanzapine, Abilify, and Geodon. And these drugs work by blocking dopamine 2 receptors in the brain. And while this can be effective in reducing symptoms of psychosis, agitation, or even depression in the short term, the long-term use of these medications can be associated with neurological damage. So let's jump in and talk about the first type of brain damage that we've seen from these meds, and this is brain shrinkage. Now, for a long time, researchers have wondered why the brains of patients with schizophrenia looked different from the brains of patients without them. And what they found was that the ventricles in patients with schizophrenia appeared larger. Now, a ventricle in a brain is a fluid-filled space, and these ventricles will begin to look larger if the brain tissue surrounding them begins to shrink or die off. And for a long time, researchers said that this was evidence that schizophrenia is this degenerative brain disease where neurons are dying off. But not all researchers, because some of them wondered whether this could actually be an effect of the drug itself. They wondered whether the patients with schizophrenia, because they were on these antipsychotic medications, were experiencing brain shrinkage. Not because of the schizophrenia, but because of the drug. So they wanted to do some clinical trials where they could look at this problem but this is really challenging because one of the challenges in this research is you would need to have two groups of patients with schizophrenia, one unmedicated and one medicated. And given the widespread use of these medications, it was hard to find unmedicated patients, but it's also hard to convince patients with schizophrenia and psychotic symptoms to forego treatments for long periods of time so they could do these MRI studies. And because we can't do these studies in humans, researchers came up with another way of looking at this. They decided that they would give these medications to healthy monkeys because these are the most genetically similar to humans. That's what Dolph Peterson and his research team did in 2005. They looked at macaw monkeys treated with olanzapine or Haldol for anywhere from 17 up to 24 months and what they found was shocking. The healthy monkeys who were given Haldol or Olanzapine experienced an 8 to 11% reduction in their brain weight compared to the healthy controls. And what they found was that most of the neuronal loss was in the frontal lobe. So these are the areas in the brain that are associated with high-level thinking, strategic planning, executive functioning. Now, this finding was very concerning, but not all people were fully convinced by these animal studies. And some were arguing that we don't know if this is even relevant to human. Maybe humans are more resilient. And while I think that's unlikely because I would already be concerned if we were seeing this in monkeys, I think there is some merit to this argument. And so researchers kept on looking into this. And the next researcher to pick this up was Fusar and Polly and his research team. And they looked into this in 2013. They analyzed more than a thousand patients with schizophrenia on antipsychotic medication over a period of 72 weeks. That's like 17 months. And then they compared them to healthy controls without schizophrenia. And what they found was eye-opening. Over time, they saw that there was a progressive decrease in the gray matter volume and enlargements in the lateral ventricles in the schizophrenic patients on antipsychotics, but not in the other patients, not on the drug. Now, I know a lot of you aren't uh, familiar with some of this language, but gray matter volume is neurons. So when we look at the brain, we have gray matter and we have white matter. White matter is a lot of the connections between the neurons, but the gray matter is the other neuronal cell bodies. What that means is they're seeing reductions in neuron. I mean, you could say this is brain atrophy or brain damage. And when they started to look at these patients with schizophrenia to see what was associated with the most neuronal loss, what they found was it was associated with the cumulative exposure to antipsychotic medications, meaning the more antipsychotic you had taken, 
over a long period of time, the more likely you were to have neuronal cell loss. And interestingly, they did not find that the duration or the severity of the patient's schizophrenia was associated with the gray matter loss. Now, what that means essentially is it doesn't look like having schizophrenia or having more severe symptoms of schizophrenia was associated with that because that might be a confounding factor that would make it look like that because you could say something like, well, the patients on more antipsychotic had worse schizophrenia. And then because of that, you would say, well, it's not the antipsychotic medication. It's actually because they just had worse schizophrenia. But that's not what they were finding. When they were looking at these associations, the duration or the severity of the schizophrenia was not associated with the level of neuronal degeneration. It was just the cumulative exposure to antipsychotic treatment. And so for me, having looked at this evidence now, what's happened to the monkeys and what we're seeing in humans on this medication, I would say that's quite compelling evidence that antipsychotic medications, when used long terms, may be associated with some brain shrinkage or neuronal damage. Now, the next sign of brain injury from antipsychotics I want to talk about is for tardive dyskinesia. Now, this is a complicated word, but it essentially describes a type of movement disorder caused by these medications. And it's characterized by involuntary repetitive movements of muscles. Typically, this starts around the mouth and you'll have lip movements or your tongue will be moving, but sometimes it can progress to the rest of your body and you could start to have jerking of your shoulders or even your torso. Unfortunately, this can be a permanent side effect and researchers and clinicians studying this have noticed that for many patients, it can be irreversible even after coming off the medication. And this suggests that this side effect has been caused by direct neuronal damage, which has not healed even after the drug is removed. Now, studies that look into this to try and estimate how frequent this risk is have found that this occurs in about 4 to 5% of patients annually. That means about 1 out of 20 patients on these medications will develop tardive dyskinesia per year. And for patients who have been on these drugs for several years, it's quite often that you see 20 to 30% of the patients have tardive dyskinesia. And this risk continues to increase the older you get. And the prevalence of finding tardive dyskinesia is at about 50 to 60%, particularly in patients over the age of 45. What this suggests is there may be less neuronal resilience in older patients, and so then they're more likely to get this side effect. And from what I've seen reading the medical literature, the group at the highest risk of having these side effects are women over age 65. One of the saddest things about tardive dyskinesia was for a long time, psychiatrists used to dismiss this because it would happen in patients with psychosis and schizophrenia. And they would say things like, well, this doesn't really bother the patients, almost suggesting that they weren't aware of it or because of their psychotic illness, it just didn't really matter to them. That couldn't be further from the truth because in a recent survey of our patients with tardive dyskinesia, 70 to 80% of them were aware of this movement disorder and 50 to 60% felt self-conscious or embarrassed about it. And nearly half of them said that it was affecting their ability to perform their jobs. So this side effect is not something to be thought of lightly. In fact, a lot of patients experiencing this really don't like it and it has a big impact in their life, which can potentially be permanent. Now, the final piece of cognitive damage that I want to talk to you about is actually the link between patients with hard eye dyskinesia, so the side effect we just talked about, that involuntary movement disorder, and cognitive decline. One of the most concerning things about tardive dyskinesia is that it's an indication that these drugs are damaging neuronal tissue. And many doctors think that the neuronal damage is only confined to the areas of the brain responsible for movement. However, I think this is really wishful thinking because why would this damage only affect one area especially when both human and animal studies are showing broader brain shrinkage. And there's actually good data to suggest that this isn't confined to one area such as movement, but it's actually happening for multiple other things that the brain is doing. In particular, cognitive decline. Tardive dyskinesia and cognitive decline appear to be going hand in hand with many patients which is suggesting that there may also be some permanent cognitive decline in these patients. And so when researchers have looked at this and they looked at 206 patients with schizophrenia, the patients who had tardive dyskinesia showed more significant cognitive impairment and a higher score on the PAN scale in the negative symptom domain. For those of you who are not familiar with the PAN scale, this is the most common research tool for assessing the symptoms of schizophrenia. And the negative symptoms are the ones such as low motivation, you know, not talking, being withdrawn, 
not socializing. Those were all of those areas where patients were performing worse if they had tardive dyskinesia. In addition, when other studies have been conducted to look at patients with TD, they've also found that these patients perform worse on cognitive tests, particularly in things like attention and visual spatial skills. And this makes a lot of sense based off those earlier animal studies where we found that a lot of the frontal cortex and even some of the parietal lobes were the spaces that were most affected by this. And if you know a little bit about neuroanatomy, you'll know the frontal lobe is associated with attention and the parietal lobe kind of sitting just behind the frontal lobe is associated with visual spatial skills. So it's no surprise that these patients were having deficits there. And so from my perspective, because these cognitive declines are going hand in hand with TD, I worry that these may be potentially irreversible because that's what we're seeing with some patients with TD. And unfortunately, I think a lot of doctors miss this and they don't warn their patients about it. Because something like TD and involuntary movements, you can't really explain that away by someone's schizophrenia or someone's bipolar or depression. It just doesn't happen in those conditions. But if someone's having some cognitive deficits, it's really easy for a doctor to just say, well, it's part of your underlying illness. We see some cognitive dysfunction in these things. And I think this is potentially completely overlooked. And that is a bad thing because it needs to be acknowledged because everyone should be warned about this if they are going to take these drugs. And in particular, I really worry about drugs like Seroquel, which is given out at low doses for insomnia. And a lot of people think that they can't get tardive dyskinesia on a low dose. But if you look at the Seroquel label, it says it right there in plain English. Tardive dyskinesia can occur even at low doses after using the drug for a brief period of time. And I don't think anyone would want to take that drug for insomnia if they knew they could potentially develop enduring brain damage from it. So let's move on now and let's talk about why this neuronal damage is occurring. The thing is, no one really knows. But one theory is, is that prolonged dopamine suppression actually causes oxidative stress. And this leads to an imbalance between the free radicals and the antioxidants in the brain. And this imbalance can go on to damage the neurons. So now that we understand a little bit more about why this is happening, let's talk about what you can do about it. Well, the first thing that I would say is the best preventative measure is to avoid starting antipsychotics, especially for conditions when they aren't necessary or there are other safer drugs. Again, thinking about Seroquel and insomnia. Another area where you may want to avoid them is is for things like depression that isn't severe or causing suicidal thoughts. Because let's think about it. If you're someone that's depressed and you get on one of these medications and all of a sudden you develop neurological damage or some enduring cognitive problems, that's going to make you feel worse. That will make you feel more depressed than you are now. And so you want to be really, really careful about using these medications for depression, especially in the long term. You also want to be really cautious about using these meds if you're a woman and if you're over age 65, because that's the highest risk of tardive dyskinesia. And if you do need to take them, maybe you have a severe psychotic illness or really severe depression and you just have to take them anyway, try and take them for the shortest period of time. Work with your psychiatrist to taper off as soon as you're well and only use them when it's absolutely necessary. And if you do need to take this medication long term, aim for the lowest possible dose and remember to stay engaged and proactive in your treatment. Make lifestyle changes like avoiding alcohol or stimulating drinks. Consider trying an anti-inflammatory or ketogenic diet. I have seen people completely recover from conditions like schizoaffective disorder. I mean, it's not this panacea that's going to work for everyone, but simply dietary changes have had a massive impact on some of my patients. Another thing that you may want to do is to do a comprehensive functional medicine workup. This panel will look at things that most doctors will miss. It can look at heavy metals. It can look at mold. It can look at nutritional deficits. For a long time, I thought this stuff was completely overblown and it wasn't that useful. Having been in this space for a while and talking to a lot of patients, these things have actually helped them feel better. Now, by doing these things like the diet and the proper workup and all of that, that that may just reduce your reliance on these medications. And so you can bring the amount that you use down. And so always stay proactive in your treatment and look for non-drug ways to manage your depression or psychosis. One thing I want to add is that there's actually groups. So if you have a psychotic illness and you want to avoid taking antipsychotics, you want to look into groups like the Hearing Voices Network. This is a community of people who are living with psychotic illness and they're trying to avoid the medications or take them at the lowest possible dose. And they do a whole range of groups and they have lots of resources. So that may be of interest to you. The next thing I want to talk to you about is supplements. Now, there are several supplements out there that have shown promise in mitigating the risk of TD by reducing that oxidative stress. And so vitamin E is one of them. This is a powerful antioxidant that may help prevent TD in high-risk patients. You can also take drugs like NAC or glutathione, which also reduce free radical damage. 
There's things like coenzyme Q10, which is a powerful antioxidant that can re- reduce oxidative stress. And you also want to take things like omega-3 fatty acids and fish oils as these have strong anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective effects. If you are taking these medications long-term, you may be interested in taking some of these supplements. Now, finally, specifically for things like tardive dyskinesia, there are some pharmaceutical options out there. And these are drugs such as valbenazine or ingreza or dutetrabenazine or ostato. These are VMAT inhibitors that reduce dopamine release, and they've been shown in clinical trials to reduce the symptoms of tardive dyskinesia. However, what I will say is they come with a lot of side effects, things like worsening depression, suicidal thoughts, hypersensitivity reactions They can be very sedating as well. They can cause some cardiac arrhythmias also, and they put you at a higher risk for NMS, which can be a life-threatening adverse reaction. And they can also cause signs of Parkinsonism. Now, not everyone is going to get these side effects, obviously, but I bring these things up because I want you to know this is a powerful drug. And from my experience, working with my patients after they've already been harmed by a drug and they've developed something like TD, they're usually pretty wary about getting on another pharmaceutical, especially if it has serious side effects like this. Another thing I'll mention about these drugs is they are really expensive and they can sometimes cost thousands of dollars per month to be on. So from my perspective, they're not really a great option. So that's my deep dive on the neurological effects of antipsychotics that no one is talking about. I wish I could end this video on a more positive note and say that recovery from TD and these neurological things happens in everyone. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. And while many patients will improve once they come off the medications, Others continue to suffer from these symptoms long term. And that's why I think this message is so important. People need to know these things before they get on the drugs in the first place. Now, I know we've been talking about antipsychotics today, but if you're interested in learning more about the causes of psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia, the rational use of antipsychotic medication in this condition, and also tapering, be sure to check out this interview with a world-renowned schizophrenia researcher, Dr. John Reed.